Take your Bibles, please, and turn to Romans 16, and we'll stand and read this passage. Uh, Romans 16, beginning with verse 17. We're talking about Paul's love for his Christian friends. Hopefully, we'll finish Romans tonight, and uh, we'll start with verse 17. Now, I urge you, brethren, note those that cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned, and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. For your obedience has become known to all, therefore I am glad on your behalf, but I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Timothy, my fellow worker, and Lucius, Jason, and Sosipater, uh, Sosipater probably is the way the, you ought to pronounce that, my countrymen greet you. I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, greet you in the Lord. Gaius, my host and the host of the whole church, greet you. Erastus, the treasurer of the city, greet you. And Quartus, a brother, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery kept since secret since the world began, but now made manifest and by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations according to the commandment of the everlasting God, for obedience to the faith, to God alone wise, be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. It's kind of like Paul is trying to finish his sermon and doesn't know when to quit. Because uh, three times he kind of gives a benediction in the passage. And, uh, and he gave one in chapter 15 as well. So uh, uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But let's go to the Lord in prayer as we look at this passage tonight. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for uh, being able to see the heart of the Apostle Paul as he... Uh, recalls and recounts these different individuals that he wants to greet. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to know that love and fellowship among our church family. And, Lord, may, may it be a sad thing when we have to leave or when someone leaves our fellowship or someone passes away. Uh, we pray that our love for each other will grow. Thank you for this opportunity to gather together. We ask your blessings upon our time together in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. In chapter 16, Paul is kind of focusing his remarks on his relationship to some of the believers in the church at Rome. And he reveals that love in four different ways. And we talked about that last time we started. We talked about his praise. In verses 1 and 2, he speaks especially of a lady named Phoebe. Phoebe was a member of the church at Sincrea um, near Corinth, and she was the one that was entrusted with the responsibility of delivering this letter to the church at Rome. And so uh, he praises her for that. Secondly, and we talked last time about Paul's pleasantness, he continues to pleasantly recall uh, people in the church at Rome. He loved these folks. He had not visited Rome yet. But he mentions 34 people or households in this passage. And um, uh, he, he had an affinity and a love and a appreciation for these folks and their, their um, testimony for Jesus Christ. Some of them he had met. Some of them he'd even been in prison with, as we talked about last time. But it was a pleasant experience in his mind to think about them and to recall those things. I um, shared with Dolores and Brother Dale the other day a little piece of video. And if you're on Facebook, you can go to my Facebook page and you'll find it. But it was on an 8 millimeter film that uh, was a 1960, probably three or four, uh, after the junior-senior banquet party that our church put on for juniors and seniors. And, of course, there's all the 60s big hair and the poofy skirts and all that kind of stuff. 
But my, uh, my folks and the Kearns are in that <coughs> little video. And uh, I, I recall with fondness uh, those times. Um, our pastor and his wife are in the video and some other folks from our church and from some of the other churches in the area. And it, it was just, even though there's no sound and you can't hear anything, but uh, I remember those faces. And I recall with uh, great fondness uh, some of those dear people that I had grown up with. And uh, Paul is like that. He is thinking about things in his mind. And it, rather than list everything, he just starts spouting off names. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, there are 34 different names that are listed in here, including the household of Aristobulus and Narcissus. But anyway, 34 different people that he recalls and he greets as a kind of an ending to the letter. Now, you, you would think, uh, you know, we do letters a little backwards. We, we write, dear so-and-so, write the letter, and then we say, sincerely, Howard Gortney, or sincerely, whatever the name is. But, but in those days, Paul identified himself at the beginning of the letter, so you knew who was writing, and then he takes time at the end to greet everybody. So it's a little backwards than what we do today, but that's kind of how it goes. Now, we come to the third thing, and that is Paul's prudence. Paul prudently gives a warning to the church at Corinth. And um, he's talking about how we should love one another and the nature of God's love for us. Um, it does not rejoice. God's love does not rejoice in wrongdoing or in unrighteousness. And so it's the nature of genuine love to warn those loved against the harm that other things might do to them. Um, you tell your child when they're very young, don't touch the stove hot. Don't touch the stove. Why? Because you're mad at your child? No, because you don't want to burn fingers. Don't want to end up going to the emergency room. So you warn them about that, which is to harm them. Why? Because you love them. And in the same way, believers are to warn one another of that which might harm us. And so the greatest harm against believers is that uh, it undermines God's truth in which they live. Love is ready to forgive all evil. That's for sure. But love never condones or excuses evil in the lives of anyone, especially in the church. And so Paul found it necessary to insert this little caution to the church at Rome. To truly love somebody, if you love your kids then you want what is good for them, right? And you know that ice cream is not good for them all the time. I remember in Kansas City, we had a couple who came to our church, and they had a little, like, three-year-old, and the only thing he would eat is popsicles. And, of course, you know, he had the red or blue mouth to prove it, whatever kind of popsicle he was eating at the time. And uh, anyway, but... but, but you know, they wouldn't make him do anything different. And, and that's all he ate. And so, I, you know, hopefully the kid survived and didn't get scurvy or, you know, whatever. I don't know. But uh, anyway, uh, if you want, if you love somebody, you want what is good for them. And you want to oppose what is bad for them. And try to keep it out of their lives if possible. It's true of husbands and wives' love for each other. It's true of a parent's love for his children. It's true of a pastor's love for his congregation. That's the way it ought to be. If we love somebody, you want the best for them, and you want to be against what might harm them. And so Paul demonstrates his love for the church at Rome by giving this caution and expressing he, he's praising them for what they've done. He's recalled with pleasantness their their uh, work in the Lord and their service for the Lord. And some of them had even been to jail with him. And now he prudently warns them of what's going on uh, to, him, to um, cause them to watch for something in particular. Now notice, if you would, he says in verse 17, I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned. And avoid them. That is such an important phrase. And is really important for every church. No matter what age. Um, 
In Titus chapter 3, Paul says we're to shun foolish controversies and genealogies that stir up strife about the law. He said, why? Because they are unprofitable and they're worthless. And we're not supposed to do that. Uh, in 2 Timothy, he talked about we're to refuse foolish and ignorant speculations. And Paul here is talking about something that's more serious. He says he is warning about those who challenge and undermine the teaching that they had received from him. Because he was an apostle who gave the truth that was divinely given to him. And he was warning them about it. He says, you keep your eye on people who want to draw you away from what you've been taught from the word. And that's important for all of us. Mark those as false teachers and avoid those people. Don't get into a debate about it with them. Uh, you mark who they are. Now, there's an interesting word here in the, in the passage. It says, the, I, the idea is keep your eye on. It says, note those. The, the Greek word is where we get our word for scope, as in microscope or telescope or uh, what's the thing you stick in your ear? Uh, o oto, no, it's oto something scope, something like that. Well, but anyway, that's where we get our word. In other words, he says you examine these people, you scrutinize them, because if they're teaching false doctrine, it is a danger to the church. It will cause division in the church. Examine and scrutinize them carefully. Now we're not talking about going on a witch hunt and try to find fault where there is none. We're not talking about that, but we're talking about, you know, people who adhere to the word of God and they believe the Bible, they are constantly made fun of for their uh, dependence on God's word. And then, you know, some of the critics of the Bible will proof text and, and say, you know, well, there's stupid things in the Bible. You know, there are dumb things that if you say you believe the Bible, you're just an idiot. Well, that's not the case. Uh, the, the truths of God's word are universal. The truths of God's word are timeless. And it's important for every generation to know God's word. And if you hear somebody that speaks against the word of God, then mark that person and just avoid them. Don't, don't, uh, don't listen to them because they'll be divisive. If you believe in the inerrancy of God's word and the authority of scripture... You're a dinosaur these days. And yet, you know, what do we have if we don't have the word of God? We don't have anything. It, we don't have anything if we don't have God's word. And so that, that's important for us to know. Uh, the ones who truly cause destructive re division and, and disharmony, um, Paul says, they practice falsehood. They are... They are teaching false doctrine. Don't listen to these people, and they're unrighteous in their claims. Uh, turn to Galatians chapter 6. I don't have this on the screen, but if you'll just turn to Galatians chapter 6 for just a moment, and I'll find it with you. Uh, no, ch I'm sorry, chapter 1 and verse 6. Um, Paul's letter to the Galatians is a little different than any of his other letters. He, he identifies himself right in the first verse, but then by verse 6, he is hot. And notice what he says in verse 6. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you into the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another. But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you other than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. In other words, Paul is saying um, there are people who do not believe the gospel as it's been delivered to you. And they're coming in and they're saying, and they're called the Judaizers. They're saying that you have to be circumcised and you have to follow the feast and you have to follow the law in order to be saved. Yeah, it's good that you believe in Jesus, but you have to add this other stuff in order to be saved. And Paul says, that's a false gospel. He said, I'm amazed that you would follow this nonsense uh, than what you've heard to be true from me. 
And so he warns them about that. And that was a big issue for the Apostle Paul there in Corinth. And then he goes on to say in verse 8, he says, If we or even an angel from heaven were to tell you anything different than what you've heard from me, let him be accursed. Let him be anathema. Uh, this, is, this is wrong. And so Paul was cautioning them very prudently, cautioning them against false teaching and false doctrine. And um, by the way, he is not teaching that true believers have the right to inflict injury on anybody who is a heretic. We don't do that. Now, could I say this very quickly? Um, during the Reformation, both Protestants and Catholics did some horrible things. Now, on both sides, there were some horrible things done. Uh, during the Crusades, in the name of Christianity, a bunch of Muslims were murdered. And vice versa. And I don't think that's what we're talking about at, at, at all. And so, uh, think about it. When Jesus was with John and uh, James and John, and there was a group of Samaritans that refused hospitality to the Lord and his disciples, uh, James and John came to Jesus and said, Jesus, do you want us to call for thunder and lightning to come down on them and destroy these people? And Jesus said, no. In Luke chapter 9, he said, you don't know what kind of spirit that comes from. Uh, the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And that's in Luke chapter 9. But, um, and in fact, in one of the most strong rebukes that Jesus ever gave to Peter was there in the Garden of Gethsemane. When Peter pulled out that sword and he swung and wanted to cut Malchus's head off and then he ducked and got his ear you know and um, Jesus said you put up your sword because if you live by the sword you'll die by the sword so I don't believe by any stretch of the imagination that we're to justify physical violence against anybody who has a differing opinion on what the word of God says um Listen, I, I don't agree with the LDS church about a lot of stuff. But we're not supposed to go set their churches on fire. Uh, I don't believe in, you know, a bunch of the cults. I, I don't believe in what they teach at all. But, uh, and Islam is probably one of the, the biggest and has more members in their religion than even Christianity now. Um, but we're not supposed to mistreat those folks. We're supposed to teach the truth and live a, a life that is exemplary of the love of Jesus Christ to everybody, no matter who they are. And so, um, so Paul warns them against false teachers. And he says, look, you're not to debate or dialogue with these people. You're to avoid them. And there are certain people that are toxic and you got to avoid them. Reject what they teach and protect fellow believers and those that are immature in the faith. Uh, keep them from being uh, deceived and misled and confused by teaching the truth. And, and think about this. You know, Paul often debated with other religions. You remember in Athens, he got up there and he says, I noticed that you guys have a statue to the unknown God. Well, I'm going to tell you about that guy. Because you can know him, you know. And he often debated with people, but he didn't, he didn't uh, try to burn down the synagogues or uh, burn down the temples that were made to false gods. He just simply preached the gospel. Um, and by the way, he didn't give them a platform uh, to preach a false gospel. He didn't allow that. And you don't, you don't debate with those people. You denounce that. Um, and if they're teaching false doctrine, you, you denounce that. It, it's sometimes helpful for um, Christian workers, especially pastors and Christian teachers and that kind of thing, to become familiar with um, the false teachings of false churches. But it's not wise to totally dwell on their error. Let me tell you why. Jesus said it this way in John chapter, and let me get to it here. Well, 
uh, Brother Dale, am I locked up? There we go. Back. Jesus said this way, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You don't have to spend a lot of time on error. I think it's wise to know something about that. But if you know, it's, it's kind of like, um, well, let's go to this next verse. Uh, that we should no longer be children tossed, about, tossed to and fro with uh, every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. He said that he didn't want that to happen. Some people concentrate on error so much that they become um, weak in their uh, evangelistic efforts for the Lord. Um, Paul, as he warned the church at Ephesus, and you know he was about to leave them, he said, I'm not going to see you anymore. He didn't shrink from declaring to them the whole counsel of God. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 7 says, For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things and draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those that are sanctified. In other words, Paul warns those Ephesian leaders. He said, you got to stick with the word and you got to stick with what you know to be true. Because false teachers are going to come in and try to subvert everything that we've worked for. And that happens any, anywhere. So Jesus himself repeatedly warned against false teachers in the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew seven fifteen. he said, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Uh, in other words, you know, um, you, you don't get grapes off a thorn tree. You know, you, they're just... By their very nature, false doctrine is deadly and damning. And so we, we, he warns us about that. Um, and by the way, he gives two negative reasons for turning away from false teachers. Number one, he said their motives are wrong. And notice what it says in the passage. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by smooth words and flattering speech, deceive the hearts of the simple. Uh, Paul says it this way in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 18. For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping. That they are enemies of the cross. Whose end is destruction. Whose God is their belly. Whose glory is in their shame. Who set their mind on earthly things. And so it's important that we watch about. Uh, false teaching and false doctrine. Um, but, but we do that by knowing the truth. And that's important. He says in 2 Timothy 3, 7, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres resisted Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds disapproved concerning the faith. <clears throat> so watch about these false teachers. Not only are their motives wrong, but look at the second reason. He says the results of their teaching are destructive. If they promote, you know, there's, there's some people who want to promote um, this ecumenism that, you know, we're all one in Jesus. So let's all get together and join hands and sing Kumbaya and, and uh, whatever that means. And, um, but they deny important truths of God's word. Like repentance, like the inerrancy of scripture, like the, the um, oh, that Jesus' death on the cross is the only way to get forgiveness. And consequently, when they do that, they undermine the very foundation of the gospel itself. And so Paul warned about that in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. 
Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. Uh, Any love that does not acknowledge God's truth has no part of God's genuine love. Uh, Love and truth go together. And by the way, um, love and sound doctrine will keep a church in balance. You know, you love sinners, amen? But you balance that with sound doctrine and you deal with sin in the body when necessary. And that's, that's important to understand. So the love of God commands and commends and can never separate the truth that God has revealed. And so you avoid people. But there's something else there. There's a positive reason. He gives the two negative reasons that their motives are wrong and their teachings are destructive. But he gives a positive reason as well. The report of your obedience has reached everywhere. I think that's significant. He, he says, I thank my God in chapter 1 and verse 8. Uh, through Jesus Christ for you all. That your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Isn't that neat? That you hear. Boy, I always like to hear good reports about people. You know, He said, you remember that kid that was in your Sunday school class back then? Well, uh, not only is he a pastor, but he is pastor in a great church somewhere, or he's on the mission field somewhere, and he's reached people for Jesus. And, you know, some, some of these kids that grew up in youth groups when I was a youth pastor, you wondered, I mean, you, you look at them and you understood why some animals eat their young. You know what I'm saying? And, and I, I mean, they're just, uh, you, you never thought they would ever turn out to be anything, but some of them, man, are living for Jesus. And Serving God. I, I think of uh, Clint's brother, Cody. Uh, boy, if there was any kid who was just a loser, a um, drug dealer, and just a sinner, it was Cody. And now he's pastoring one of our churches in North Carolina and doing a great job. And just thank the Lord for him. So Paul had good cause to rejoice because their faith was spoken of throughout the whole world. And he knew that even the most faithful believers can fall into Satan's lie, into the trap, and to deceit. And so he wants us to be wise concerning what is good and um, innocent in what is evil. Look at Matthew 10, 16. Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of the wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. That's what Jesus said. Um, We are not going to be free from temptation until we get to heaven. So for the rest of our lives, while we live in this carton, in this body, we're going to be subject to temptation. Now, we don't have to yield to it. Uh, When we do, we can ask the Lord to forgive us. Amen? But we don't have to yield to temptation. If we do, it's an act of our will. And so... We don't want to rationalize our failings and our faults. We want to repent of those and ask the Lord to forgive us. You know, you, um, you don't have to sift through the garbage to know that garbage is bad. In fact, you stay around the garbage long enough, you'll begin to smell just like it. Right? I mean, it just, it just gets on you. So you don't have to do that. You don't have to dabble in the garbage of the world. It'll taint you. And so um, be innocent concerning that which is evil and be wise regarding that which is good. It's kind of like, you know, when they train bank tellers to watch for counterfeit bills, they don't hand them a bunch of counterfeit bills. They give them the real thing and said, you just come become familiar with this. And as you're counting it, you'll feel a difference in a counterfeit bill. You know the truth. The truth will set you free, Jesus said. You learn about the counterfeit by knowing what the genuine is. And so it's kind of like when Paul talked about the resurrection in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He spends one verse. He says, there's some of you that don't believe in the resurrection. And then the next 40-some verses or 50-some verses in the chapter he talks about why he believes the resurrection. And so he just spends one verse about the fact that somebody don't, doesn't believe it, but he spends the rest of the chapter defending it. So that's what we, that's what we need to do. 
um, God's going to destroy the false teachers. In fact, he's going to use us, the Bible says, soon. Uh, that means speedily or quickly. It's encouraging that the Lord will crush Satan under the feet of believers. That is interesting. But that's what, it, that's what he says. And so he gives the a second benediction there. And um, he's, he's given one in chapter 15 in verse, what is it, uh, 33. And now he gives this um, other benediction here in chapter 16 and verse 20. He says, and the grace of the, and, uh, and the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. And it's almost like Paul thought, oh, wait, Tertius, take this down. And then he says, Timothy, my fellow worker, and Lucius, and Jason, and Sosipater, my countrymen, they also greet you. You know, you guys want to say anything? <laughs> And so he has him write it again, and then he goes on and he says, I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, greet you in the Lord. Gaius, my host and the host of the whole church, greet you. Uh, Erastus, the treasurer of the city, greet you. And Cordus, a brother, we're not exactly sure who these people are, by the way. That leads me to the last one, and that's Paul's peers. He sends greetings to the church on behalf of some of his uh, companions that are with him. Um, this Lucius... Uh, he could have been a native of Serene, we're not exactly sure. Uh, maybe one of the prophets or teachers in the church at Antioch. And it's likely that this Lucius that he's talking about was one who may have uh, commissioned Paul and Barnabas on the first missionary journey. Uh, other scholars think that it might be a, a different name for Luke, Dr. Luke. Uh, whether that's the case or not. Uh, Luke was with the Apostle Paul on some of his missionary journeys, and he refers to himself uh, as we, uh, when they talk about we went so-and-so, that Luke was uh, included on that. Uh, but we're not exactly sure if this was Lucius of Antioch or if this is Dr. Luke. Uh, we just don't know for sure. He refers to this Jason and Sosipater as kinsmen. Uh, it is likely that they were simply fellow Jews, not necessarily relatives. But one of the first converts at Thessalonica was a man by the name of Jason. You remember that? And uh, by the way, um, some interesting things about some Bible names. But um, Jason's house was assaulted. Do you remember? And um, anyway... Apparently, Jason hosted the Apostle Paul in his own home for a short time and while before he and Silas went to Berea. And um, anyway, uh, Acts chapter 20 talks about this man from Berea named Sopater, S-O-P-A-T-E-R. Some think this might be a shortened form of Sosipater. I don't know. Uh, but anyway, it's, it's likely that these people, Paul had come in contact with them somehow. Tertius was an amanuensis, and that's like a secretary. He uh, took the dictation and wrote the letter of the book of Romans. He, it was his handwriting from the words of the Apostle Paul, and he's the one that wrote it down. And so Paul, he did this on a number of occasions. If you'll notice at the last part of the book of Galatians, he says, you see how large a letter I've written with mine own hand. Uh, it's likely that the first part of the book of Galatians, he had uh, an amanuensis like Tertius to write this down, but he was so concerned that they got the message that he, he himself wrote in a big, scrawling uh, penmanship style. And some people think that maybe Paul's eyesight, that was what his thorn in the flesh was, and that he had to write real big to where he could see it. We don't know that for sure, but anyway, he used secretaries or an amanuensis to write a lot of his, these letters. And so just as Phoebe had the great responsibility of delivering the letter, Tertius had the responsibility of writing it down. And uh, God used him in that way. This Gaius that's mentioned here, we're not exactly sure who this was. He's probably referring to the congregation that met in his house. Um <clears throat> We know about Agaius from, uh, from Corinth, and uh, his 
full name would be Titus, Gaius Titus Justus. So it's likely that that's who it is from Acts chapter 18. We're not sure. Erastus, we're not sure where he came from. Um, he's probably not the one mentioned in Acts 19 and in, Acts, in 1 Timothy 4. Uh, but anyway, he was, uh, this Erastus was the treasurer of uh, Corinth, the city treasurer. So he's a man of influence and prominence. And he greets them and, and says to the church at Rome, hello. Quartus is another one. Uh, we're not sure. It's possible he could be the biological brother of Erastus. We just don't know for sure exactly. But then Paul gives a third and final benediction. And I want you to notice this and we'll close. Um, he, he says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. You'd think that would be the end of it. And then he thinks something else. Okay. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. According to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began. But now made manifest and by prophetic scriptures made known to all nations according to the commandment of the everlasting God. For obedience to the faith. To God alone wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. And the letter finally ends, and um, Paul probably wished he could have added another. Uh, Brother Hembry used to say when he was preaching, he'd say, as he got to the end of his message, he'd say, boy, I wish I had another hour and 75 or 80 minutes to preach on this, you know. And uh, anyway, uh, so we're, we're going to close with that. Um, we may uh, take up 1 Corinthians um, in our next study. I'm trying to decide, but... Um, anyway, I hope you've enjoyed the book of Romans. Do you have any questions about anything we talked about tonight? All right, let's stand and we'll be.